Ninja Leaders Podcast, episode number 22. Hello and welcome to the Ninja Leaders Podcast, the podcast that is dedicated to helping you and your student organization reach that next level of leadership. I'm Nick, your host, Nick Walkowski, and I am so glad you could be here with us today because school is starting and so is the brand new season of the Ninja Leaders Podcast. It has been truly an incredible summer, and I'm very grateful that you could be here uh, with me today checking out this interview. Uh, But I have so much I want to tell you about this summer. It's just jam-packed, so many cool new experiences, so many great lessons. So I uh, got, got the chance to speak to so many different organizations. It was just awesome. But all of that is going to have to wait till a future episode because in this episode, we have a great interview lined up with Kent Julian. Kent Julian, is he speaks to student organizations Uh, around the country delivering a message of how they can show up and shine in every single area of their lives, which really allows them to live it forward. Uh, This is really a great interview that's going to help you kickstart this brand new school year and get it off on the right foot. So I definitely want you to be sure to listen to all this interview and actually stay tuned because after this interview, I have a very special gift just for you. So here we go now to Kent Julian. Kent, I want to thank you so much for joining us here today on the podcast. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me, Nick. And Kent, I've uh, kept talking to people and people just kept coming up to me and saying that you need to talk to uh, Kent. You need to talk to him. I kept hearing that from several different people. So finally, I'm really happy that we're actually able to connect with each other. I was able to get you here on the podcast. We were able to chat a little bit beforehand. So I'm finally, I'm super excited that I get a chance to talk to you for this next, you know, 30 minutes or so. Oh man, I appreciate that. Right back at you there. Well, Kent, uh, why don't you, I gave our listeners a quick little overview of who you are, but I wanted to give you a chance to really introduce yourselves and tell everyone about you. So who is Kent? Well, Kent, first of all, is Kent Julian. Uh, I'm a found, I'm founder of an organization called Live It Forward LLC. And uh, it started out as a career coaching uh, organization, and uh, slowly but surely it turned into an organization where I do a lot of speaking, especially in the CTSO market. So I do a lot of speaking, real passionate about uh, personal development and leadership, madly in love with my wife. Uh, I've been married for over 20 years, have three great kids. Um, so I coach a swim team, which is something really unique. I coach a swim team that has 180 swimmers on it. And yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. I do that during the summer and it's just nuts and, and love it. And that, that puts me hands on with students uh, on a regular basis, you know, and all, all those swimmers uh, live within a couple miles of my house. So I'm out on the, the road a lot speaking to big groups and yet I'm personally involved in uh, a, lot of, a lot of young people's lives. So I kind of have the best of both worlds that way. And that's just awesome. I know I'm really excited to actually dive in a little bit of your message and maybe hear a little bit more about your coaching uh, and some principles that you learned from through that. But first, we always like to start off uh, these podcast episodes with a success quote. So, Kent, do you have a favorite success quote? I actually have two. I have uh, one is, yeah, I'm going to give you a double bang for the buck here. Uh, one is uh, what you believe in is evidenced by how you live, not by what you say. So again, what you believe in is evidenced by how you live, not by what you say. I originally heard that by a guy named Ken Davis. Uh, I think there's a lot of people have probably said it, but you know that really impacted me when I heard it from him. And then this quote is being used all the time, and it's attributed to multiple people. So I don't know where it originally came from, but it is great, and it really encompasses what I believe in as well. And that's hard work beats talent every time talent doesn't want to work hard. So those two, for me, they're not just uh, quotes that I love. I feel like they really represent kind of who I am in, in, in my DNA and what's important to me as well. And that's awesome. I, I love both those quotes. And Ken, I really want to bring this kind of ta- down to the ground level, if you will, for our listeners. So what is one way that you actually apply this in your, your everyday kind of life? You can pick either one of the quotes. What's one way that you actually apply them in your day-to-day life? Man, those are, that's a great question. Um, I, the, probably the one, hard work beats talent every time talent doesn't work hard. I apply that. I, I was an at-risk uh, youth 
and had major, major learning challenges. Couldn't read in third grade. Uh, graduated with an SAT score so low I couldn't get into college. I did go on to get a, uh, get into college after I went through this thing called developmental studies. Um, went on, graduated with honors, graduated my master's degree, very top of my class. And what's interesting is um, I look back and I look back at those learning challenges and I don't see them anymore as uh, disabilities. I actually see them as things that gave me the ability to learn how to work hard. Um, and and they've, they are things that have made me successful. And so I found that it is true. There are a lot of people uh, that are a lot smarter than me that didn't do nearly as well in school as I did simply because I learned how to study. I learned how to work hard. And then that not only applied in school, what's really cool is that ended up applying into my career uh, early on before I did my own business. I was pretty successful in what I did. And now that I have my own business, I'm pretty successful. Hard work in marriage. You have to work hard in a marriage to have a good marriage. So in all those areas, you don't have to be super talented to be successful. Uh, the key is more that you work hard and you work hard on the right thing. So you work hard and smart. So hard work does beat talent every time talent doesn't want to work hard. I, I love it. I love it. And I totally agree with that. And I want to actually dive into something that you just said right there at the end is if you learn to work on the right things. So, uh, Ken, I guess, do you have any suggestions for our listeners about kind of narrowing that down, trying to figure out ways that they can actually decide what is right for them? Yeah, I mean, I, I went, you know, we, uh, you hear a lot of speakers talk about setting goals and, and uh, living a, um, an in, intentional life. And I've kind of divided my life into five major roles that I think we all play. One is uh, what I call my personal development role. What do I do physically and mentally and spiritually and all those things to become the best I can be? So I really focus on that wor role and working hard. Next one's professional role. And, and that can be, you know, when you're in school, your profession is to, to get a degree. Um, and to learn leadership and all those different principles. But when you come out, it's actually a job. So what can you do in that area? Uh, third to me is family. Who am I as a husband as, and as a dad? And how do I interact with my brothers and sisters, my mom and dad? Uh, fourth is my in the community. How do I serve my community? How do I serve and give first to my community? And then finally is stewardship. You know, I've been blessed with all kinds of different uh, resources. So how do I use those in the most positive way? And for me, being able to kind of look at my life instead of dividing it into pieces, and I, I look at it instead holistically that I bring my whole self, my mental self, my physical self, uh, my emotional self, my spiritual self to all those things. And then I just try to say, okay, what hat am I wearing at this time? And so in every area, in every one of those areas, I try to work hard at what's most important. And it's usually working hard on uh, those areas are usually about the, the people you're serving and the people you're leading, not about you. Oh, that, that's excellent. That's excellent. So, Ken, I want to jump back and look a little bit more at your life. So what is actually some maybe accomplishment that you are extremely proud of? Oh, man, there's a there's a bunch. Of, as I already said, I'm uh, very proud of my relationship with my wife. We have a great relationship. Uh, we know it's it's kind of special. I mean, we view it as special. Other people might think theirs is just as special, and that's fine. But we view it as special. I'm very, um, I'm very proud of how I've been as a dad and how I invest in my family first. Uh, I was my first career. I was actually worked uh, in a religious setting, and I was what's called a youth pastor, and did that for uh, about 20 years, and moved from a small church to the to the largest church in the organization of churches I worked with to and then I became the national youth director. So that was, you know, just career wise, um, you know, I went about as far as you could go in that path. And I really enjoyed that. I'm very proud of my business, you know, kind of moved out of what would be called ministry and into uh, working with uh, in the education market and specifically in the CTSO market. Love, 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 love working with student leaders. So just proud of that and again proud of my swim team just absolutely love you know being with those students I, I've been doing it now back at it for seven years 
And as I've been back at it, you know, I've built relationships. Kids that swim for me are from four years old to 18 years old. And so I've got kids that are now in high school that were swimming for me when they were seven or eight years old. So it's been a, it's been a blast to invest in that. I'm very proud of that as well. And just, just with your taking your swim team, what is some major, maybe uh, things that are, you're most proud of about them? Uh, we, uh, really focus on, we really have a balance. There's two things, especially with my older swimmers. So my middle school and high school swimmers, and and that's really, I love them all, but that's where I feel like I really show up and shine in, in the way that I coach. Um, I really am proud of how many of them really get the principle in their goal setting of, uh, high intention, um, but low, uh, uh, high intention, but, um, low attachment. And so high intention means when they're swimming, uh, they've got certain times they're trying to hit and they're doing their best that they can. And so they're giving it their all while they're in the pool. But then if they don't hit that, they're not so attached to that goal that it ruins the rest of their day, their night, their their week, you know. And so in swimming, you're usually swimming three to five events per meet. And so if you don't learn how to set goals that way, one bad swim can ruin your whole meet. And so... They need to learn high intention. I'm really going after this, but low attachment. If I don't make it, it's okay. It's not going to, you know, get ready and do the next one. And that's a great life principle. So just that's just an example of, you know, I hope we win. I, I'm all, I'm very competitive. I like to win. But to me, it's, it's the life skills and the leadership skills that our coaches are, I mean, that our swim team's learning. And in fact, probably to, to answer your question a little bit more directly, what I'm most proud of is now my coaching staff is uh, 11 different coaches that have all swam on my team. Only one of them is a college student now. All the rest are still in high school. And when I started, I had one assistant coach that was on the team. So we've just built this whole kind of leadership factory and they're doing a fantastic job it's made my job just tremendously much more easy and and not only easy it allows me to focus on things I need to focus on and they're actually running practices encouraging student uh, swimmers teaching them so it's really fun to see student leaders step up into that role and not just because it's kind of their they feel like it's owed to them but because they've really earned it and they're doing a great job well, and I think that is such an important thing that you're touching on right there because, uh, you know, we both work a lot with student organizations and one of the th- big things for them that they're always trying to do is cultivate new leaders, yep. cultivate those people because, you know, at, for sure after four years, you know, they're, they're getting a whole new set of leaders coming into that organization. Most of them are turning people over, you know, within a year. So what are some ways that you've actually kind of, how have you fostered that culture or kind of built that leadership factory to, you know, continue to turn out these high quality leaders that are now stepping up and filling these roles? Man, that is a great question. And um, probably the thing that I've, I've done the best is I've championed the right kind of people to be leaders. So in other words, what I mean is uh, you, there might be a student who has natural leadership ability, but they are not leading, they're not going to lead people in the right direction or what, they're not going to lead people in the principles and values that are important to our team. And they do not get what I would call any stage time at all. I don't, I, I will not permit them to step into leadership roles. I, I always say, who's the most comfortable in our situations, the leaders that I want to be leaders or the leaders are going to lead people the wrong way. And I, I make sure the people who are most comfortable on our team are the leaders who really buy into our values and what we believe in as a team. And so what happens over time is that becomes, you know, more and more of those leaders, whether they're quote popular or different things, when they're really solid leaders, as I champion them and as our team continues to champion them and give them more and more responsibility, they become the role models. And over time, it just becomes part of our culture and our DNA. And so you're, you're almost uncomfortable on our team if you're not buying into the values and the principles that, that we hold dear and that we feel like are important. So it's, it's really interesting that way because the, the way you asked your question – Seven years ago when I started the team, it wasn't like that at all. I, there was only one person that could be an assistant coach with me, and that was it. 
And uh, it took two or three years of really, really working and champion. Here's what we value for students to start stepping into that. And then the more that we got to step into it, the more it just became part of our culture. And how do you kind of go about the process of actually figuring out what those values are? Uh, Because I know some uh, organizations are kind of at that point struggling. You know, maybe they've had several different advisors the last few years, but they're trying to actually figure out, okay, what does our organization actually stand for? What does it mean? Well, you know, in the CTSO world, one good thing is there's there's national directives and there's national organizations. And they've been doing it long enough that they know what's going on and they know what's work. It's not that they know everything, but that's definitely a place to start. Uh, number two, I, I would say look around at other states or at other schools that have great whatever, if you're FBLA, FFA, other great organizations like that. Uh, when I came into the league my first year, you know, you, I, I'm in a huge league. It's the second largest league in the, the nation. Uh, it's almost 7,000 swimmers. And so uh, when I came into the league, we're in a certain division and we swim with six teams. And then we go to this thing called county meet where all 45, 50 teams are there. And you're there for two full days. Well, two full days watching coaches and swimmers, you know, interact with one another, you start to realize this team's got it going, not because they're winning, but because they're, they've got a holistic view and they're, they're competitive and they're winning, but they're teaching the right values. And so you, I, I would take those, uh, grab a, a bite to eat during county meet with coaches that I could tell they knew what they were doing. So that's how I do it. I just, I just try to network with people that are like-minded, that are a little bit beyond where I am, uh, always trying to learn and develop that way. And uh, man, what a great uh, way in student organization and CTSOs, not only to lead your own organization, but to network outside your organization, personally develop. Who knows where that could lead, even for your future. So there's so many wins for doing that. Well, yeah, and basically you're just lining yourself up with a bunch of different mentors, which is something we constantly talk about here on the podcast. So any regular listeners know we talk about the importance of finding mentors, and that's basically exactly what you're talking about. So I just want to highlight that again. Absolutely. Great word, mentors. Yes, yes, definitely. (laughs) Uh, So, Kent, we've been talking a lot about uh, successes, accomplishments, but we all know that on a team, on an organization, you know, you have those outstanding successes, but then, you know, sometimes things don't always work so well. So, Kent, do you, have you had any failures in your life at all? Never. Never? Never, ever. I I, I figured. (laughs) I'm about as perfect as they come, yeah. Well, no, not, yeah, I've had a ton. Um, Just personally, uh, the two biggies that popped in my mind when someone asked me that is one, uh, before I met my wife, I actually got engaged to another girl. She was a great girl, not a good fit, um, not a, not a, and I, and I wasn't a good fit for her. And that could have been disastrous. I mean, it was, it was disastrous enough. We ended up getting engaged and almost got married. Um, but that rocks your world. I mean, that made me take that whole thing of marriage and made me think way more seriously about it than I was. Uh, again, it ended up being a real positive thing, but through the midst of it, it was really, really challenging. And then another one just personally is uh, after I was having some success in my first career, um, in fact, I was having a lot of success, I made a career move and picked up my family and moved them. And it was when my kids were really young, and it was just a horrible move, and it was it was all my fault. I didn't read the situation right. I... I moved way too quickly, um, and it again, it rocked our world. It impacted my marriage. Uh, um, we, we, it ended up creating you know, three or four years of a mess uh, for me professionally and, and even in, in my family life, and I take that real responsible. Again, it's turned out great because it was the catalyst that got me to start thinking about doing my own business. Uh, but I probably could have figured that out a lot in a lot uh, easier manner. So those are just two personal things. I mean, I've made all kinds of leadership successes. I've said things uh, in front of five or six hundred students that came back, you know, just said something very inappropriate in leading a meeting and had to deal with parent fallout from that, uh, made some strategic uh, uh, bad decisions as far as 
putting on events and uh, food not being delivered. I mean, all those kind of things. But when you talk about mistakes, those are the two biggies that really rocked my world. Uh, well, I actually want to kind of dive into those a little bit more and maybe pull out some actual tactical lessons that we can that our uh, listeners can learn from. So you can take either of them, but do you have any like big lessons that you really gain from those mistakes? Absolutely. You know, most um, most people are wired a certain way, and uh, I mean everybody's wired a certain way. And I, I'm real familiar. I don't know if you know the DISC personality profile, but that's something I'm real familiar with. Um, so anyway, the way we're wired, if we're not careful, a strength taken to an extreme can become a weakness. So one of my strengths is I'm pretty decisive and I'm pretty driven and I'm a results-oriented guy. Taken to an extreme, I go way too fast and I don't slow down and I don't listen to the advice of others. And in both those situations, that's what happened. Uh, I just made decisions way too fast and got out ahead of where I should have been. And so since then, I, I, I try to remember this, especially on big decisions. I try to remember, for me, I got to slow down. And that's not for everybody, but for me, like some people who are very cautious and who who think through things and analyze things, they need to speed up. But but if I'm not careful, I don't think through things enough. I don't analyze things enough. So I actually need to slow down uh, when, when it comes to big decisions. So uh, again, probably the principle behind that is be careful because a strength taken to an extreme becomes a weakness. And so you want to make sure you play to your strengths, but you don't go overboard. Don't put them on steroids and make them become a weakness. Oh, that's awesome. That's an excellent lesson. Um, so I know you have it. I want to dive into one of these little formulas that you actually have. Ah, and yeah. it is E plus R equals O. Yeah, so my favorite. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it's not original with me. So, okay. you know, I, I always make sure I don't take credit for it. It's original with a guy named W. Clement Stone. He was one of the early, early success uh, personal development uh, gurus out there. And so what he said is uh, events, which stands for the E, the E stands for events plus our response, the R, equals our outcome. And, that, and so I've just taken that concept and I've really, in, in presentations I give and leadership training, I talk about how there's two different types of people. The vast majority of people out there are E equals O type of people, events plus, I mean, events equals our outcome. So whatever happens to us, that dictates our outcome. And uh, so the problem with that is we're, everybody's going to experience bad events sooner or later. And so if, you know, everything's going right, good for you, your outcome's going to be okay. But sooner or later, something's not going to go right because we're totally out of control of the events. And when that happens, it messes up our outcome. So I, I like to call those people show up and whine people. They just, you know, they show up in life and they they do they they fall through life. But what happens is when an event doesn't go the right way, they whine about it or or it or it takes them out. Um, but the successful people, the best leaders, and this is it's hard to do. Uh, but you know, so I always say this: if you do this, if you follow this principle, you move from the bottom 90% into the top 10 instantly if you'll live by this principle, E plus R equals O. If you just add the one thing you're 100% in control of and that's your response, you can take any outcome and it can be a positive thing. So in my case, take this learning disability that the reason I was an at-risk kid is I wasn't responding to it right. I was saying, hey, I'm dumb, uh, I'm not going to amount to anything and so I was living out into that outcome. I was living into that outcome and I had a, a teacher and an advisor really challenge me when I, when I got into huge trouble. They were talking about suspending me from school. Uh, he just really challenged me to own my response to this thing and get, and get in control and for some reason I was listening and started following that and everything changed and so that bad event that I was out of control of, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, my response to it totally has changed the outcome. And uh, I always use this when I'm speaking to um, CTSOs. My daughter um, was diagnosed with, one of my daughters was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes about four years ago. 
And I won't, I, you know, I do, I go through the whole story when I'm presenting, but um, long story short, she could have responded to it one or two ways. She could have been become bitter or she could have become better. And she chose to become better. And she told me once that uh, type 1 diabetes has made her a better person. And I said, no, it hasn't. It's not the events that made you better. It's your response to them. Because we know a lot of people with type 1 diabetes. And type 1 diabetes isn't like what you hear on TV. That's type 2. Type 1 is a really serious disease where your, your pancreas shuts down. I mean, it's a very, very serious di disease. And there's a lot of young people because it, it only hits young people. Uh, they, they call it juvenile diabetes. There's a lot of kids my daughter's age that are bitter. They're not better. And she chose to get better. So it's E plus R equals O. That R makes all the difference. That, that is awesome. That, that, yeah. that is a great formula. That was a great story. Uh, let's try and make – do you have any suggestions for our listeners on how they can move from maybe that being that person who just shows up and whines to actually controlling their response? Yeah, and by the way, E equals O is show up and wine. E plus R equals O is show up and shine, baby. Uh, it's where like you it. walk like in, it. and I mean, you're you're always making a difference. And it's not shining on you; it's you're making a difference so much that you 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 are such a servant and such a leader that you show up and shine. Uh, yeah, I always say there's I I look at it. This is an interesting analogy. I look at it as fence posts. I wish I had a little, uh, I'm trying to do it right here in the, <laughs> in the <laughs> screen. Uh, if you can imagine a fence, you know, you have four sides to a fence and there's four things you're responsible for. You're responsible for your attitudes. You're responsible for your actions and achievements. You're responsible for your articulations, what you say, and you're responsible for your associations, who you hang out with. Those are four areas you're 100% in control of that you can take control of. You can't control any of the events in your life. You really can't. You think you can, but we don't know what's going to happen to us 10 minutes from now. But the one thing we can control is our response in all those areas. So like a fence post, if I take 100% responsibility for my life in those four areas and I'm responsible for my actions, my attitudes, my articulations, and my associations, and I'm, I'm making positive choices, those fence posts just continue to grow and grow and grow. And there's all kinds of freedom in these fence posts and more and more opportunities and responsibilities come our way. But the moment we step beyond those fence posts and we're not taking responsibility for our actions, we're blaming other people, we're whining about things, or, or we're hanging out with the wrong people, or the wrong associations, any of those four areas, those fence posts begin to shrink. Now, when we're students, it's usually because, you know, an advisor says, no, okay, you're not, in con you're not responsible, so we're not going to let you do this. And what that advisor is actually trying to tell you is in real life, guess what? You get out there and it, the same thing's going to happen. That's what society is going to do to you. So that's how you live in E plus R equals O lifestyle. You think about those four fence posts and there's tons of freedom inside those fence posts. And if you want more freedom and more opportunities and more responsibility, just take responsibility for those four areas and boom, it just grows really, really, really big. I really like that analogy that the four pen fence posts. I think that really drives it home. Uh, so Kent, I just we're getting ready to wrap up, but I have a couple more questions I want to ask you. Uh, so, what is uh, one thing you wish you would have known in high school? Oh man, I probably wish I would have understood the the opportunities that were out there for for me. I think because of I had some insecurities, and because of some of those learning disabilities, I, I think I took the path of least resistance. And the business I have now, you know, again, you just you, you, life comes, and you, you take the most you can out of life, and you do the best that you can. But looking back, if I would have known um, that I could have done some of the things I'm doing now earlier, I would have started it a lot earlier. And so, if if I'm a student, man, I mean. I had tons of opportunities when I was growing up. The opportunities now are unbelievable, unbelievable what you can do in your own business, how you can help people. 
So if anything, I feel like I mean I, I feel like I got out of the gates a little slow, and I wish I would have gotten out a little bit faster, at least as far as really finding finding what I was passionate about. I, I I'm an entrepreneur DNA in my blood, and and I just miss that going through uh, school, wasn't exposed to some of these CTSO organizations. So, man, if, if, if you're in CTSO, that's a gift, man. You really have it. And that's one of the reasons I'm attracted to it is I really want to help students realize, man, the opportunities you have in front of you, they're, they're tremendous. They, they really are. They really are. It's just amazing uh, what I get to see so many students doing in their CTSO, all their different projects, you know, taking ownership of things. Absolutely. It's just awesome. It really is. Uh, Ken, right now, actually just this morning, I was on Facebook and I was looking through some of the posts and I saw people were posting pictures of them going back to school. So school is starting right now as we're recording this. Do you have any recommendations for uh, maybe those new freshmen, whether they're transitioning first into high school or even those freshmen who are just starting their first day of college or post-secondary yeah, I, I've, I've got two things. One is I would say use uh, high school and or college to help you figure out what you're passionate about. So look for opportunities. You know, Try a lot of different things. Look for opportunities. When something sticks, go deep with it and learn from it. And then here's the other thing. Somebody gave me this advice, and man, it when I went to college, and it just made sense. So many people, when they go to college, they get busy – uh, you know, working jobs and, and doing all, the, you know, just having all kinds of stuff going on. And I know we've got to pay for college. I understand all those kind of things. But never forget when you go to high school and to college, your number one job is to get that education. I mean, that's that's your job during those four years. It's not to work in a pizza place or try to make a lot of money. It's It's to get the education and discover what you're passionate about. And you're not going to have an opportunity like that, you know, really again. I mean, once you uh, get married, once those things, you have those kind of responsibilities on your shoulders. Um, it's not that you can't. You can do that. But you, you've just got a lot of other stuff that you have to, uh, that you are responsible for, that you have to take into consideration. But when you're in high school and you're in college, it's kind of just you getting to uh, experience all, all these different experiences. So, so those would be the two things. Really understand that getting that education is your job, and then also finding out what you're passionate about and what what motivates you uh, is your job as well. So that's what I would probably suggest. And by the way, my uh, three kids went back to school a week ago Wednesday, so oh, nice. we're in the midst of it here. Yeah, it's crazy. It's it uh, seems like summer just started not that long ago and just disappeared. I uh, know it's August, man. It's still summer. They should shouldn't be in school yet. <laughs> well, luckily, most schools in Wisconsin actually don't start till September, so they kind of are lucking out here a little yeah. bit. But uh, so, Ken, if our listeners want to learn a little bit more about you, where is the best way to find out more about you and what you do? KentJulian.com. And they'll find out what Show Up and Shine is all about, kentjulian.com. Awesome. And I'll be sure to include a link to that in the show notes. But Kent, do you have any final piece for, of advice for our listeners as we kind of send, this off, send them off? Uh, I would probably go back to the two quotes that we started with, we, which is, uh, what you believe in is evidenced by how you live, not by what you say. And so if you really believe in something, live in such a way to bring that into existence into your life. Don't just say it, live it. And then the way that you can bring it into existence into your life is remember that hard work beats talent every time talent doesn't work hard. Nice. Thank you so much, Kent, for all of your words of wisdom. Uh, it was great to be with you. Thanks for inviting me. No problem. I told you that would be a good one. Uh, a big, a really big takeaway for me from this interview was that whole formula E plus R equals O. The events that happen to you plus your response equals your outcomes. Uh, we really have the power to control our outcomes by shaping our responses. It's such a powerful concept, not necessarily an easy one. It's something I know I struggle with a lot um, and still I'm kind of working to improve on. But when I do remember to control my response or actually shape my response, uh, the outcomes 
truly are amazing. Uh, like I said, this is such a powerful concept and really it is in your hands. But now before we end the episode, I have two very special announcements for you. The first is that this next week, uh, basically the 9th through the 11th, I will be in Nebraska working with their FCCLA chapter officers at their fall leadership workshop. I am super excited about that event. It'll be great. There'll be you know, hundreds of uh, students there, chapter officers that I get the chance to interact with. And if you would like to bring me in to uh, uh, do a start of the year leadership or team building event, all you have to do is just send an email to nick at nickwalkuski.com. Super easy way to get connected with me and we'll go from there. And if you really enjoyed this interview and want to make sure that uh, you don't miss a single episode, what I want you to do is actually go to nickwalkuski.com slash awesome. That's going to help you uh, subscribe to all the episodes, give a chance to leave a review, and there's also going to be a very special gift for you there. It is the six incredible steps to uh, help you achieve more than you thought possible. Very long title, uh, but very powerful concept, a very great process. And it's something that I know will definitely help you out in the start of this brand new school year. Great spot for you to start setting some of your goals, helping you, you know, kind of Get ready to make the most of this entire year uh, that you have, whether it's your last year in high school, your first year in high school, first year in college, or you're getting ready to transition into the real world finally. Um, so just go to nickwalkuski.com slash awesome and you can get that training there. And now until next time, be sure to go out and take action. <laughs>